Free Live? Or is it Memorex? That used to be a commercial. Is it live or is it Memorex? You got to be my age to remember that. We're live? Yep. All right. Here we go. Uh, thanks, folks. Appreciate you watching. Oh, I got to turn down my, my volume on my phone here. Sorry about that. Appreciate you tuning in for another episode of Elk Talk Live, uh, brought to you by so many great companies, Bowtech, Leupold, Onyx, which we called Onyx Maps at one time, uh, Tight Spot, uh, Quivers, Ripcord Arrow Rest, Black Gold Sites, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Uh, if not for them, we wouldn't be able to do this. And now we're back on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock. Last week, all of you were so kind to let us roll it back to Tuesday. And the reason we did that, we're in Arizona, Northern Arizona, and we had to hike in the next day, way back in the wilderness. And it was, remember I told you the plan was go in two days early, figure it out, then hopefully sort it out, and then during the hunt, you get to pack one out? Well, it worked. The second evening we shot a bull. So we drove her over here right now to New Mexico, straight from Arizona, and uh, we're going to do some scouting tomorrow and Friday because the season for the Leupold folks opens on Saturday. And we're going to be doing exactly what you, we, we talk about in all this Elk Talk Live stuff. Remember we talk about the five calendar periods. We got the early season, the pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut. Well, right now, peak rut is kind of in the distance it's getting closer to post rut right now if we're going to see bulls with groups of cows the odds are they're going to be the younger bulls the two and a half and three and a half year old bulls the old boys the five six seven eight year old bulls they're going into these nasty terrible places that are going to be a challenge to one kill one and two a challenge to get it out of there so from here on out the peak rut is kind of behind us. You're still going to hear some bugling. Most often it's going to be by the younger bulls. But uh, that's what we're doing right now. And uh, we'd really appreciate you folks accommodating us last week. Uh, because of your accommodation, I think that was a big part of why we ended up and, and lucked out and were able to, to shoot a bull over in Arizona uh, this weekend. So... Remember, if you like the Elk Talk Live thing, it's really important that you share this with your friends. And if you want to get notified, it's because there's going to be times where we might have to go live earlier or later on a different day, make sure that you're texting the, the, the word Randy or the name Randy to 313131 or if you're in Canada, 393939. So, all right, let's, are we ready, Marcus? I apologize for being in a motel room again, but this is the first comfortable bed I've slept in in six or seven days, so hopefully I won't fall asleep. Uh, let's see. Thoughts on Unit 16C in New Mexico. Great hunt. My son had the youth hunt there in 2007. Uh, if you have that tag, you're going to have a great hunt, no doubt. Uh, what's my favorite over the... What was this one? Someone said, uh, what's my favorite over-the-counter tag and why? Ooh, Andy, let me think. It depends on the weapon. If you said it had to be archery, my favorite over-the-counter tag for me because I live in Montana is the Montana archery tag. If it's rifle, mm, boy, I don't know. I just I love the over-the-counter tag in Colorado. It's been it'll now this year I won't get there either. It'll be two years since I've done it just because of schedules. But the second and third seasons in Colorado allow you to do that. Uh, Probably the mix, if you're both an archery and a, a rifle hunter, I know it's not an over-the-counter tag, but it's a general tag for non-residents. It's called the Wyoming G-E-N for general. That's probably the best general tag in the West if you hunt both archery and rifle. Oh, what do you got, Marcus? Anything there? Oh, Randy, did you hunt muleys in Nevada this year? Brandon, yeah, I did. Uh, we already posted the day-by-day -day hunt out on our YouTube channel. So go to randynewberg.com. I think it's six days long. Uh, it was an archery mule deer hunt this year. Uh, holy cow, they're coming in. Um, what's the best way to quickly scout and find out which elevation the elk are at? What's the best way to quickly scout and find out what elevation the elk are at? Elk aren't necessarily going to be tied to an elevation. Uh, 
I, I wouldn't focus so much on elevations as I would locations. Uh, the quickest way to scout and do it is before you go on your hunt, when we've done a bunch of these videos about e-scouting, in fact, uh, Bowtech was promoting these e-scouting videos and, and these five periods of the rut, all this, or five periods of the elk season, all this. Do your e-scouting at home. First of all, know what hunt you have. Do you have a rifle hunt? Do you have an archery hunt? If it's archery, is it in the early season or is it in the peak rut? If you have a rifle tag, is it in the peak rut? Probably not. Is it post rut? Mm, very likely. Is it late season? Very likely. So depending on which of those tags you have in the calendar period you're going to be hunting, go and understand what the elk need in that calendar period. And we've done all these videos about them. Uh, once you know what the elk need in that calendar period, that's where you're going to find them. It's that, that's the easy way to do it. Oh, gosh. Uh, what system do you use for your rifle to keep under your arm? A bunch of companies make them. Go and Google the term. You, a lot of people see that I have my rifle tucked on the waist belt of my Mystery Ranch pack and attached to the shoulder strap of my Mystery Ranch pack. Uh, Mystery Ranch makes one, a bunch of companies make them. They're called Gun Bearers, G-U-N-B-E-A-R-E-R, -E -E a gun bearer. Google that term and you'll find a bunch of companies that make them. Uh, let's see. Hey Randy, I'm taking my friend rifle hunting in third season in Colorado. Any tips for, for making sure he has a good overall experience? Yeah, smile. Uh, make sure you have fun. You're going to run into a lot of hunters. You, you just have to accept that. So don't get frustrated by the fact that there's a lot of hunters on the over-the-counter units in Colorado. In third season, you might have a little more snow. If you have snow, you might find the bulls a little bit closer to the winter range. And the Colorado Parks and Wildlife has the best interactive game atlas of any state out there. It shows you the winter range, the summer range, the migration corridors. If you're hunting third season, you're probably going to want to be hunting somewhere near those migration corridors. Maybe if it's warm, up top closer to the summer range. If it's been cold and brutal winter, maybe closer to the winter range. And then, once you know what those places are, go and look in the places other hunters are less inclined to hike into. And that's going to be your best chance. As far as making sure they have a good time, have a reasonable expectation. You're not going to shoot record book bulls on an over-the-counter unit in Colorado unless you are really, 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 really lucky. But it's a ton of fun. All those communities, they welcome hunters. You're going to run into a lot of people who are there hunting. You're going to have a blast. So have a reasonable expectation. Put a smile on your face, and I can guarantee you it'll be a good experience. Let's see. Have I considered coming to California for blacktails and mule deer? Yes, I have. Um, the, up in the northwest corner of, of uh, California, there's an area called the Trinity Alps. I have a friend who's invited me there. He does very well up in that wilderness area. The downside is, in that area, I've not been able to get a film permit for the wilderness area. Every time we film on public land, we have to have a film permit. Some places allow us to some of the forests will give us a film permit in their wilderness areas and some won't. So anyhow, it's appealing to me. I'm, if I'm going to go hunt Columbia blacktails, uh, anywhere from Northern California on up to Oregon and Washington, someday I just got to go do it. I talk about it, that in Roosevelt Elk. I just got to get it on the calendar. Uh, let's see. What was that one? Do elk eat mainly grass or do they eat shrubs and bushes too? Josh asks. Elk are mainly grazers. Grasses uh, are their primary food source, uh, but they are very adaptable. If there aren't a lot of grasses, forbs, shrubs, um, they will make a living. Uh, where, where we were at in Arizona last week, they eat aspen shoots. These little, if you've ever seen an aspen regeneration, a fire or some disturbance causes regeneration of aspen, it just comes up with these little shoots, these suckers, these aspen trees about this long. Elk are just creaming them. So mostly look for grasses, but uh, they will select other highly nutritious stuff. Um, but look, look mostly for the for the grasses. 
Uh, does temperature change the effect of bulls from bugling? Steve Peter. Uh, I think temperature causes elk to be more active at night. I, it's not going to change the rut. And let's just talk about full moons and temperatures right now. Last week, th this week, we were in the full moon period in Arizona. You could look out the tent and you would swear someone was shining a flashlight on my Hilleberg tent. It was that bright of a full moon. Now, if I listened to everybody, it'd be, oh, don't go hunt the full moon. Well, guess what? Elk were bugling all night long. We could hear them from our tent. During the day, they pretty much shut up because it was warm and it was a full moon. Now, in September, in the peak rut, people will say, oh, the, the rut's late this year. No, the rut is never late. The rut is a photo period thing that happens based on the amount of daylight. If you think about it, if elk were to change their rut period based on hot temperatures or accelerate it because of cold temperatures or because of full moons, their calves would be born too late or too early. There's a reason why all this happens. We have a tendency to think the rut is later because of hot weather. Like the question being asked is, how does hot weather affect bugling? It pushes it to be a nighttime activity. When it's really hot, a bull elk spends way more energy trying to stay cool, thermal regulating, than he probably does when it's 20 degrees out trying to stay warm. Same with the moon phase. If it's a full moon, my experience is that you're going to have most of that bugling activity at night. And since we hunt during the daylight, we have a tendency to say, oh, the rut's not going on. No, it's still going on. It's just... It changes what time during that 24-hour period, the nighttime, when a lot of it happens. Now, in Montana this year, in a lot of the northern Rockies, we've had a lot of snow in September. We haven't had some of that hot weather. Some people are still saying, you know what? This week was really great. That week, hmm, didn't hear anything. So I, I think we, we as hunters try to find uh I guess, reasons for what we're observing when really it's happening the way it always happens. Uh, but I, for as far as temperatures, I think hot temperatures, you're going to see most of that activity happen at night. And it's a hard hunt when it's hot. That's why it makes it so hard because they're bedded down in the shade during the day. Long way to answer a short question, but I, I thought it was good to expand on that. Am I hunting Montana for elk this year? I got two days of grouse hunting in in Montana during archery season, and we did call in a bull. Uh, my buddy Bart and you had it come in at about five yards, but it came through the brush, looked right at him, and took off. Uh, I'm not sure what I, I am going to get to deer hunt in Montana. I'm going to go over to southeast Montana like I always do, um, but I don't know what I'm going to get to elk hunt in Montana. Our calendar has us just going everywhere. So, uh, oh, I will be in Montana for my son's moose hunt. I, I will be there for that. So, uh, will I ever hunt elk in California, Christopher? The odds are just about no, because I don't apply for uh, tags in California. And the, even if I did for non-residents, I think it's like really close to zero as far as the, the chance of drawing. Um, Oh, let's see. Hey, Randy, any tips for second season mule deer? I'm going in a week and a half here in Colorado. Uh, I, I can't say that I have any tips. Uh, the weather's going to dictate it. I think the second season Colorado, the second rifle season, is probably the hardest time to kill a mule deer. I've done it once, and man, I, 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 I struggled. I did not. I saw a lot of people. The weather was warm. These smart old bucks that you're looking for, they are either really high or they're in such thick stuff that you never really get a chance to see them. I prefer to hunt the third season in Colorado. You have the second season, so there's not much you can do about it other than go there and know that you're going to have a lot of glassing. You're probably not going to see bucks moving like they will in the third season due to weather or due to the rut. Uh, just glass and glass and glass and glass and make sure you are there those absolute prime periods that you're in your glassing spot for that before the sun comes up in the morning and you stay there until the sun goes down in the evening don't leave 
because you want to walk back to the truck with still some daylight. You, if you do, you're leaving these prime places at the prime time. And that's the whole idea of increasing your chance for success. So, you got anything over there, Marcus? Yeah, do you know anything about elk hunting in Texas? No, I don't know anything about, that question is, do I know anything about elk hunting in Texas? I don't. Uh, I do know that in Texas, elk are not considered, uh, I, I think they're considered like some, they're, they're not considered a, a native species. There are some elk herds there, and I've seen some some pictures, read some articles of people who have hunted elk in western Texas, but I, I don't know anything about it. I, I know it's a rare, rare opportunity, and I think the hunting is actually allocated by whoever's land that uh, those elk are living on. I could be wrong with that, but it, that's what little I know about it. So, is it worth chasing after a bull in the post rut, or is it a better idea to wait until cold sets in and try again when you, in reference to the Montana rifle elk seasons? If I had a Montana rifle elk tag and I had to pick my one week to come to Montana, I would pick the latter part of the season. The post rut period, because this year I think... When, when do we open in Montana this year? The 21st? 20? Yeah, somewhere okay. Right the, the, you might hear a little bit of faint bugling, but after the first day of shots going off, they're going into their sanctuaries. The, if you're hunting mature bull elk on public land, you're going to have better luck the last week of season than you are the first week of season. As a general rule, less hunting pressure, the weather's going to be more in your favor. Uh, I, I would prefer to go later. Let's see. Someone, Marcus, here's a call out to you. Colby says, Marcus, you're the real MVP. You're the guy who spots everything. Who says that? Uh, some guy, Colby here. Hmm. What, what are you, you paying him or what's the deal here? Uh, advice on finding big bulls looking for a second cycle cow. Uh, that's what we hope that we do this week in New Mexico. Um, not every cow gets bred in their first cycle in September. So you will have some that come into a second cycle in the first, usually the first half of October. Um, really, all you can do is you watch the big cow groups and know that the bulls aren't going to be, the mature bulls, because this question was about big bulls, they're not going to be hanging with those herds all the time. They're going to come in and check them. No, nope, nothing there. They're going to head away for a while. They'll come back a while later, check them, no, head away for a while. Uh, whereas in the peak rut, there are so many cows in cycle, those bigger bulls you're talking about, they are just hanging with those cows. So know where the cow groups are, but understand that within the cow groups, hanging with them are going to be the smaller bulls. The bigger bulls, if there is some se second cycle activity, they're going to be nearby, and they're going to come and do their checking, but they're not going to be with the cows non-stop so just be patient know that you got to sit and watch those cows maybe all day long before you see or hear one of the bulls you're looking for i hope that's how it works here in new mexico this week oh uh, let's see someone's got a fishing question no i didn't get in on the fall walleye bite that's the downside you know what all of the really great hunting and fishing is at the same time september october and november uh, let's see. Have you ever heard mature bulls making cow sounds? I've not. Have you, Marcus? I've heard them make some really weird sounds. Though. Yeah. The bull I shot this year and this week in Arizona, we thought it was a burrow. They have wild burrows in Arizona. And, uh, we heard this. I'm like, and the camera guys heard it first because protect your hearing. If you can, it's frustrating to try to listen to bugling elk. If you haven't protected your hearing, which Randy is not, you have to rely on camera guys. But we go up there and we get close and we're set up. And I'm like, you sure that's not a burrow? It turned out to be the weirdest sounding elk bugle you've ever heard. And he, you don't got to worry about him making that weird noise in the woods anymore because he's in the freezer. But uh, let's see. Will group applying for tags in New Mexico affect your draw odds? No, it won't. Uh, it, it, here's how it works in, in just about every state that you party at, is that your party gets assigned one random number. 
So in New Mexico, there's no point system. Whether it's a group of two, one, two, three, or four, your group gets one random number. And if that random number gets pulled, all four of you, if it's a party of four, are going hunting, or none of you are going hunting. Where it could hurt you, actually, let's say you're a party of four. Now this is, a, I'm, I'm saying in some states, and you wanna check this out. Some states will say, oh, if you're a party of four and there's only one tag left, we will give all four of you a tag. Very few states do that. Most states say, oh, guess what? There was only one tag left and you were a party of four, you're all gone because there was not enough tags left to fill your party's application. So sometimes party applications in those states, if you're going for the really rare tags, it could possibly hurt your odds, uh, but it's never gonna improve. There's all kinds of them. When will a burn be too old that you would consider to abandon it? Uh, I don't know that they're ever too old to abandon uh, based on age. To me, it's based on what other options. So if there are newer burns, I abandon the older burns. But if this is a burn that's 12 years old and there's not been any other burn on the entire landscape I'm hunting, that 12-year-old burn is still where I'm going to be. Uh, and a bunch of you guys who saw me in Arizona this week when we were up hunting, we ran into a lot of people who were like, hey, I know you. Uh, they can verify that we hunt burns. <laughs> we were hunting burns up there. Um, oh, someone wants me to tell them about the, the elk hunting flag stuff. We don't have enough time for all that. <laughs> but it's going to be out on our YouTube channel here in a month or so. Uh, and it's going to be on our Amazon Prime channel. If, if you get a chance, uh, it'd be great if you could go to our Amazon Prime uh, channel. If you, and what I'm saying, Amazon Prime, I mean Amazon Direct Video. If you, get, if you subscribe to Amazon Prime, you get it for free. Uh, but also, we did a podcast about that entire hunt. And that podcast is going to be live this coming Monday. It's called Hunt Talk Radio. That podcast episode is completely dedicated to the Arizona elk hunt. So if you subscribe or, or download our uh, podcast, you'll get the full details about the Arizona elk hunt. Hey, Lucas, got, got you here. Uh, how far will bulls stay from a water source during the post rut? Boy, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I, hmm. How far away will bulls stay from their water source during the post rut? I don't know. I've seen elk walk three or four miles to water. Uh, but my personal experience is they like to find a sanctuary that has some water nearby just because they want to travel as small of distance as possible to meet their needs of food and water. Because they know the longer they travel, the greater the likelihood of getting shot. So. But I, I don't really know. Uh, I've never read any research about that. So, sorry. Uh, you got anything, Marcus? Yeah, what's the best way to locate elk bedding areas at a landscape level? What's the best place to locate elk bedding areas on a landscape level? Uh, it depends on what type of landscape. If it's steep topography, you're going to want to look for benches. If it's kind of like just general normal slope of mountain there are studies out there that say that elk tend to bed in the top third of the slope and i'm sure the reason that is is you get rising thermals that come so if this is the slope you get a rising thermal that comes up the slope and if you've ever seen i think they call it the coriolis effect is when you get this kind of circling effect i'm going to call it right up right over the ridge so what even though the wind's coming up this way you do get some of that and i think that's part of why they bed there uh but that as far as a general landscape level if you looked at big flat pinion juniper areas of say in arizona or new mexico you're probably going to find them bedding in the thickest places the most shaded places so it all depends on what they're trying to find for their comfort at that point of the season. Uh, boy, people are asking for opinions here. I don't know that I should be 
<laughs> should be giving opinions. Uh, What's the name of the channel on Amazon? What's the name of the channel on Amazon? Oh, okay. Uh, it's uh, Fresh Tracks with Randy Newberg. So if you go into Amazon and you search, uh, someone just said, hey, I'm watching Fresh Tracks on Amazon. Thanks. Uh, it will pop up. Or if you search Randy Newberg, it'll pop up. And I think if you even type in hunting in their video direct, we're one of the top, I don't know, few that, that show up. So thanks. Uh, let's see. Best way to judge mature bulls, uh, Max Layton. I'm assuming you mean when you say judge, most people refer to Boone and Crockett score. Uh, I'll tell you what I do. Uh, if it's a really big bull, he's, and, and when I say big, he's got a big frame. And this is just for me to get the quick and dirty. But I'm not really a score guy, so I, I don't do this often other than I many times people say, what do you think that bull scores? What do you think that bull scores? So I look at it. If it's a really big frame bull, and if you get the Boone and Crockett trophy database, uh, you go to booneandcrockett.com, they have this trophy search database. You'll find that the average bull has 30 inches, the Boone and Crockett bull has 30 inches of mass on each side and has a 40 inch width. Right there's 100 inches. And then they have about a 50 inch main beam. That gets you to 200. So from 200, I just start adding the length of each point, each time that I think. And that's how I, I come up with it. Um, I start at 200 and go from there. If it looks like a smaller frame bowl, I don't start at 200. I usually start at 150 or maybe 160 and then start adding the length of the times. I, I don't know that there's any science to it. That's just what I use. And I find that it gets me close enough. Um, but... If I were to shoot a bedded animal, what shot placement adjustments would I need to make? Well, a lot of people think that elk lay on their side when they're bedded. They don't. If you look at a bedded elk, they kind of tuck one leg off to the side, one leg cocked underneath. They're still kind of in the upright position. You don't need to make a lot of adjustment for a bedded elk other than you might be above it, you might be below it, you might be at, at a position that's quartering away from it or quartering to it. But as far as how its uh, profile is, you really don't have to make much adjustment at all. Um, I've never seen an elk lay on its side like a human does when they're bedded. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Someone asked, Randy, we'll be muley hunting in Montana first week of November. Will we hit the rut? Uh, for muleys, you're going to be about a week early. Uh, the peak rep for Montana, according to the biologist, is about November 15th. Hmm. <laughs> Boy, we have got a ton of them here. Uh, you got one? Okay, yeah. I just listened to your podcast with the Hushin crew. Is there any new public land issues that has drawn your attention? Are there any new public land issues that have drawn my attention? They listened to the podcast with... Uh, uh, Casey and Brian and Eric from Hush. Uh, there's always new ones. Uh, the one that, to me, that's coming up that affects public lands is they've decided they're going to review the sage-grouse plans. The sage-grouse plans were these state-by-state -state plans, all local plans, but there's a few people who didn't like them, so now they've decided, well, we're going to redo, or we're going to look at everything again. And that affects a huge part of the West on public lands. That's the one that kind of has my attention right now because I think that's the one that might have some legs to it. All the other stuff is, is a whole lot of noise, but uh, there's a lot of groups that are staying on top of this stuff that are trying to be your advocate for it. Uh, there's three I always mention that are very involved in public lands. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. If you're a member of any of those three groups, they're going to do a good job of keeping you informed of what these are and asking you to take action on the public land issues that those groups think affect their mission. So those are the ones that I would, I'd be thinking about. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm not even going to answer that one, Randy Sholey. <laughs> Uh, what, what we're trying to do, so we've received some comments that some people are frustrated that their question doesn't get answered. And if you can see right now, there's hundreds of them right here. 
Uh, there's 200 of them. And between Facebook, the multiple Facebook pages that this streams on, the YouTube channels, and the, the live stream channels, we can't get to them all, so I'm really sorry that we can't. Uh, what we try to do, now that we've been doing this for a while, is we try to scroll through and find the ones that are different. That we don't want to be answering the same question all the time. So if we don't get to your question, please understand it might be one we answered three weeks ago or two months ago. Uh, we're trying to make sure that the information is relevant and, and not repetitive. Uh, you've said before, this is Lander, uh, that bulls will stay out of big open meadows during post rut. Why? Uh, because they don't want to get shot. The bulls that stand out in big open meadows in post rut, which is the peak rifle hunting season, that trait gets cleaned out of the gene pool. It just, they the older bulls have figured that out. That, that, that's just how it is. Um, Colin asks, Randy, ever hunted antelope in Utah? Any plans to do so? Yes, I have one time, a long time ago. Uh, and I will whenever I uh, decide to burn my points. Me and a couple other non-residents are the people with the maximum non-resident antelope points in Utah. I think I have 19 or 20. Whatever the maximum is for non-residents, I'm one of the two or three guys with that. So whenever it fits my schedule, I'll do that. But here's the problem. Utah always has their antelope season like September 12th through the 20th. September 12th through the 20th, I'm going to be standing in the elk woods with my bow tack in my hand. <laughs> so the odds are I might die with all those antelope points in Utah. You never know. <laughs> uh, here's a good one. This one's relevant to this hunt, Marcus, because on our way from uh, Arizona to here, Yesterday, we stopped in New Mexico. We had a, an antelope permit, and we filled that tag. We weren't hunting for big trophies. We just wanted uh, an antelope to eat because when the Leupold crew gets here, our goal is to eat that antelope in the next week. There will be five of us. And so the Jason says, you guys harvest a lot of game. Do you do your own butchering? Yes, we try to do it if, if we possibly can. Sometimes we're on the road, we don't have any choice. It's like going from here to here to here to here and we have to use a commercial processor. Um, are there any recommendations or instructional books or videos? Uh, I think Hank Shaw's book, uh, Buck Buck Moose, has a lot of really good stuff in there. Uh, so if you go to Amazon and, and buy uh, Hank Shaw's book, I think you'll get a lot of really good information out of that. Uh, let's see. Have you ever hunted the same bull two years in a row? Yeah, I have. And I never did kill him. <laughs> he probably died of old age. Uh, you got anything over there, Marcus? Yeah, what kind of precautions should I take to secure my valuables in my truck while I'm hunting on public land? What precautions take to secure your valuables in your truck while hunting on public land? That's a good question. This year I've had two friends get their vehicles broke into. Uh, it's frustrating. I don't know that I have a really, really good answer. Um, you know, obviously lock everything up. Don't leave anything valuable there. Da, 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 da. Um, we have a cargo trailer and we lock anything really valuable in the cargo trailer because you can easily pop out a window, but it's going to take a little bit of effort to get into my cargo trailer when it's fully locked up. But I know that most people can't do that, so I, I, I wish I had an answer for that one. It, it's so frustrating to hear that, that that is happening out there, but it does. And, but one thing we talked about last week, and I hope that a bunch of you have done it. I, I've seen a lot of it out on social media, so I think a bunch of you are doing it. But if you go to BowTechArchery.com, they have this, it, it's like a social media picture frame. You put your picture in it. Uh, and Botex got a bunch of cool stuff going on there, but it says, I'm a bow hunter. Uh, and so your social media picture will be framed with their, uh, I'm not even sure how they do it, but if you go to BotechArchery.com, you'll see this thing. Click on it, and you can, I think you download it, and then when you upload your picture, you, you put that frame on it, and 
you kind of get to rep the sport, I guess. Uh, show your colors that you're a bow hunter. So go to bowtecharchery.com and it'll be there. Uh, favorite elk caliber to use and what bullet? You know, this is the. Uh, I'm gonna because it's been asked before. I'm gonna answer it again because it gets asked so many times. Got asked in Arizona this week. Most of you know that I use a Howa Alpine mountain rifle. It's a lightweight rifle. And the reason it can be lightweight is because it has a short action. The short action cartridges are the 308 type cartridges. 308, 7 mm 8 the, let's see, 243. Uh, those short action cartridges allow a more compact and lighter rifle. When I'm mountain hunting, that's what I like to have. I shot the bull in Arizona last week with a 308 Howe Alpine mountain rifle used a 165 grain nozzler partition and that bull got hit right here on the shoulder blade or on the point of the shoulder because the only shot I had up the hill and he went about 30 yards and the amount of destruction that partition 165 grain nozzler partition out of a 308 when you see that video of how much destruction that did you no one's going to doubt that a 308 with partitions is <laughs> it's elk medicine for sure. So that's my favorite to use because it's the most accurate elk rifle I have. I use high quality bullets. I got a, re a really lightweight scope on it. I have a Leupold BX6 HD uh, 2 to 12. Some of my other scope uh, rifles have bigger scopes. BX5, which is a 3 to 15 that I have, uh, BX3Is. But when I'm looking for a really lightweight rifle, there's no sense in having a really lightweight rifle and then putting a really heavy uh, bunch of other stuff on it, whether it's slings, bipods, uh, a really big scope that might add a, an extra four or five ounces. So I go with the Leupold BX6, the 2-12 to 12 is what I use on my lightweight rifles. And I can't even tell you how much better they perform than I do. <laughs> so, oh gosh. How many pins, Blaine Bishop, how many pins do you shoot on your bow? Ranges for each pin. Uh, for me, I have a, a black gold ascent sight, and a lot of you have seen me talk about this. Uh, I have a, a Bowtech Rain 7, and on black, the black gold ascent sights, you can get them in 3, 5, and 7, I believe. I should know that, but I don't. I buy the 5, and I take one of the pins off. I have four pins, and they start at 20, 30, 40, 50. Those are, if it's out past 50 yards, I got to get closer. And just my personal personal ethos of, of how I do it. So, uh, wow, someone, Justin says, I got a bull tag for the Ashland area in Montana. Any advice? Yeah, I had that tag in 2009. Uh, if you go out to our YouTube channel, you'll see it. Those are the most nomadic elk I've ever hunted in my life. You will see them here today and seven miles away. The same exact herd, the same bulls. You'll see them five, seven miles away the next day. Crazy. Don't give up. Elk densities are very low out there. There's some super quality bulls. Uh, the world record uh, archery was shot there last year. So it's a high demand tag. Go there, have fun, work hard at it, have reasonable expectations, and uh, hopefully you find one of those good bulls. Oh, wow. What do I do? What do I use to recharge my rain gear? Uh, I don't. Uh, my Sitka Stormfront rain gear. I don't have to recharge it. I can wash it, throw it in the dryer, everything, and it works like new. So, um, if if you have to recharge your rain gear, maybe it's just water resistance and resistant, not waterproof. You'll put a DWR finish on it, uh, spray of some sort, probably. Uh, that's what most people say when they say recharge it. But with my Sitka uh, bomb-proof Stormfront stuff, I don't, I don't have to recharge it at all. So just wash it and off you go. Um, Matt Riggs asks, I'm hunting in New Mexico. How do I get close enough to the bulls to take a shot when they're not rutting? Sneak. Use the terrain. Use the topography. I mean, it's it's going to be spot and stock. Uh We've shot, let's see, last year uh, when I was here in New Mexico, Corey shot a bull, spot and stock. Uh, I, and this, I'm talking archery. Uh, two years, or 
three years before that, I got within range of a bull I could have shot, spot and stock, but he was bedded, and you know, for TV, you can't shoot him in their bed. Uh, in 2011, I shot one at two yards right on a rock underneath me. Uh, that was spot and stock. So if we can be doing it with a bow, I'm, I know you can do it with a rifle or a muzzle loader. So you just have to, number one thing is wind. Wind, wind, wind. Uh, make sure you play the wind right. Try to stay in the shadows as you're moving, not in the open sun. Use anything you can to your advantage that disguises your, your movement or disguises your noise. And you'll be surprised how, how close you can get. But understand, it's a mindset of being patient. That bull is not in a hurry, so you can't be in a hurry. The bull has one thing to do, stay alive. And if you get impatient and you hurry, he's going to win because he's way more patient. He's way more alert. He doesn't, he's not distracted by, oh, I got to be home for dinner early or gosh, I got to get back to the office. Not him. He says, I got to stay alive. So it's all a mindset for me. Uh, John Camacho, what do you think about the VX3? I love it. He's referring to the Leupold VX3. Now it's the VX3i. Uh, the if if you can find a, I, I I know you can't. You cannot find a better value. Value meaning the intersection of of price and quality. You will not find a better value in rifle scopes than the Leupold VX3i. I've got them. I've got old VX3s. I've I've got them all, and so you've asked, what's my opinion? They're, they're super, super scopes, especially when you consider the price range that they're in. Oh, let's see. Will bulls come to the same rub line in October as they did in September? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure of that. I, I do find that they hang out in the same ridges, whether they're rutting in September or early October. And that's where I see most of those lines of rubs. But I can't say for sure if they will or won't. Uh, I, when I'm hunting, I hunt those areas. You know how funny it is? Like, okay, here's ridge A, B, C, and D. They all look almost identical, but for some reason, ridge B has all the rubs. It's where they're rutting. It's where they're doing what they're doing. I don't know why, but I hunt ridge B <laughs> because there's something there that the elk have decided we like this better than the others. And I've found that whether that's in September or early October, it's pretty much all the same. So, oh, let's see. Someone asks, Richard uh, says, do I need a film permit in Colorado? Just getting into the solo hunting filming. If you're going to use it for any commercial purpose, you need a film permit. If you've got a YouTube channel you've monetized, if you're going to sell the footage, if you're going to get equipment in exchange for filming it. If you're doing anything to earn value or revenue, that's a commercial activity. If it's just you and your buddies or you and your family and you're going out to film video and have a good time, don't need a film permit. Knock yourself out. So, oh gosh, there's a whole bunch of them here. You got anything over there, Marcus? Yeah, do you have any tips for hunting cow elk in the winter? Uh, tips for hunting cow elk in the winter. Yeah, go to the food source. Cow elk are now pregnant. They're carrying a fetus. They have to stay in as good of health condition as possible to carry that fetus to the calving period of May. And they, they have made it through many years of finding the best food source. Find the best food source, which unfortunately in some states is often on private land, but that's where you're going to find the cows. They need to expend the least amount of energy possible to get the greatest amount of calories possible. And that means the best food you possibly can find. They're probably gonna be lower than the bulls. Uh, they're they're gonna be in places that make it easier for them to get through the winter. Uh, Hunter asks, have I ever owned a 270? I have one and I don't ever wanna give it up. Don't give it up. The first four bull elk I shot was with the 270. I had people say, oh boy, you can't kill them with the 270. Well, those bulls didn't get the memo. And in every one of those bulls, none of them went past 30 yards. And every one of them was shot with Nosler 150 grain partition bullets. It's in a 270, 150 grain Nosler partition is going to kill every elk that you hit in a good location. Keep it. Don't give it up. Okay. A pin, let's see, 
You got anything over there, Marcus? I'm trying to sort through ones that we haven't asked or that we haven't answered before. I think you've probably <laughs> answered this one before. But... <laughs> this, some of these are way too funny. Someone says, Randy, you've said before you won't share a tent. Why do you share a hotel room? <laughs> Uh, no, this isn't a king bed. This is this is a queen bed. We got two of them here. <laughs> what was your starting with, Marcus? Uh, when you cut tracks in the snow, do you ever walk, try to walk them down? Do I ever? If I cut tracks in the snow, do I ever try to walk them down? Yeah, I do. Um, I've cut tracks in the mud and sand and walked them down before. Uh, it's very hard to do when we're filming because there's not just me. There's usually one or two camera guys, so it's just way way too difficult but i really really enjoy still hunting as i call it you're, you're following a track you're looking ahead you know where they're going you know what they're doing or you think you do uh those are a ton of fun to to, to do uh it's you against the bull it's very difficult and uh if you can do it uh it's it it's rewarding no matter what it is uh, David Watson asks, why don't you ever disclose the unit that you are hunting? This is probably the biggest criticism I get is people get frustrated and upset that we don't say, oh, we are in unit in Wyoming. We are in unit in New Mexico. The reason we don't is because if we were to do that and you look at, all right, a TV episode, a podcast, uh, add up all of our YouTube stuff, if 200,000 people had that information, it's going to skew the draw odds for the other people who hunt and apply in those units, or even if it's a general or over-the-counter unit. I, out of respect to the other hunters, I, I don't tell people where what specific unit. Now, a lot of people have heard me promote archery uh, coos deer hunting in Arizona. I'm a big advocate of archery coos deer hunting in Arizona. And a lot of people are like, well, he must be here if he bought an over-the-counter tag. Fine, you figured that out. A lot of people see me hunting in southeast Montana for deer. Well, guess what? Southeast Montana is 14 million acres. I, I, I don't mind saying, oh, we're in general areas, you know, this part of some state. I told people this year, we're in the Wind Rivers of Wyoming. Well, guess what? There's about six or eight units that make up the Wind Rivers of Wyoming. The reason we don't give precise information like that, some people even think we should give them drainages and basins and, and GPS coordinates. We're not going to do that out of respect for the other people who hunt there and the other people who apply there. So uh, I get that people want that information. But the other part of it is a huge part of the fun of all this is the research and the planning and the figuring it out yourself. That's why our old show was called On Your Own Adventures. You're doing it on your own. And we expect people, we'll give you tools that we have and let you know how we do it. Not saying it's always right or always the best way, but we want people to do as much of it on their own as possible. And that comes from the research of the units, the applications, everything else. So hopefully that's an answer that that's sufficient. But boy, I get a lot of grief over that. And, and I'm not saying that this question that anyone was, was complaining, I, I think it was just a, a, a general question about it but I do get in a lot of hot water because I refuse to do that so we got one more Marcus before we have to give big thanks to all these companies and but before we answer these last few questions I really hope you will support the companies who make this possible and again it's Bowtech, Leupold, Onyx, Ripcord, Tight Spot, Black Gold, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation these are the companies that support us in so many things that we do that we're out here trying to lower the hurdles. We don't have all the answers. We get to go and hunt a lot. We get to fail a lot, make a lot of mistakes. And we're trying to share what we learn through all those mistakes. And these companies are the ones that make it possible. They say, Randy, go out there. We'll pay the cost to do everything. You just try your best to, to give some useful information. So I hope you appreciate them. And uh, when it comes time to, to buy your hunting products and hunting gear, that, that you'll support those companies. So, What do you got, Marcus? Uh, when do the bulls usually break off into bachelor groups? Well, okay. When do bulls break off into bachelor groups? So they don't break off from the cows and instantly form bachelor groups. What you'll see is when the, the peak rut swings over to post rut, 
the big bulls will go solo. They will go off by themselves. And they're not in bachelor groups, usually in that post rut. Once you get to the end of October, the first part of November, and the post rut switches over to the late season, now these solo bulls come together and then they form bachelor groups. So there's about a two to three week window there where those bulls have left the cows and they're solo. That's why they're so darn hard to kill. And they will get in bachelor groups usually by the first week of November and then it becomes it becomes a little bit easier game for the hunter in November because now you're not looking for one bull, you're looking for maybe three or six or, or whatever. So that's usually how it happens uh, when they do that. So, wow. Next Wednesday is what? The 18th? Yeah. Yeah. So... We will, when we do Elk Talk Live next Wednesday at 8 o'clock, this New Mexico hunt will have wrapped up. It'll be the, the it, that day is when it ends. So hopefully we got some more stories to tell you about elk hunting because the Leupold, Leupold folks have two tags and we have five days to try fill two tags on public land and get it on film. So uh, hopefully I'll have great great results uh to tell you about when, when that's all over uh just like when it was you know i i was so happy when we shot the bull in arizona because i thought you know we told the folks on elk talk that we need two days to go in and scout and da 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 and hopefully this will work out and it did i couldn't believe it so anyhow you got any parting comments marcus um Mark? A of, there's a lot of questions that we Okay, Mark, Marcus is looking for one question that we haven't answered before. Uh, let's see. How have you liked the Garmin inReach? So I told a bunch of you that I went and bought a Garmin inReach, and it's been riding in my pack. I've not had to use it. I'm a tightwad. I'm an accountant in my other life. So I have the lowest service possible. I'm not one of those guys who uses my inReach that I'm going to be texting home or texting my buddies. I haven't had to use it, thank goodness. Uh, so that's that's what I know about the Garmin inReach. I have hunted with some guys. Bo Beatty had a he had the highest level of service, and he was sitting there with his inReach all the time. We're in Wyoming. He said, "Oh yeah, I got the weather report." Da, da, da. I was impressed with that, uh, but I'm too tight to pay for that <laughs> that level of service. So I want to I want to use the. Uh, uh, money for tags and, and all the other things that, that I need for hunting. So, all right. What I, I think that's that, that a wrap, Marcus. We did this whew, 52 minutes today. Hey folks, thanks for watching. Thanks a ton for supporting us and supporting these companies. If you would be so kind to go and, and follow all of these companies on their Facebook pages, on their Instagram pages. And if you'd follow our uh, YouTube channel and subscribe there, it, I can't tell you how much it helps in the YouTube algorithm. The more subscribers we have, the more our content moves up the playlist and gets in front of more people. Uh, if you subscribe to our podcast, Hunt Talk Radio, that would be great. You can subscribe by, via iTunes or Stitcher. And if you watch uh, a lot of our stuff, we're on the Sportsman's Channel right now on Sunday nights at 9 o'clock Mountain Time. Uh, please watch us there. But if you don't have that package or you don't uh, have any other way to watch it and you are an Amazon Prime member, go to the Amazon uh, Video Direct and you can watch us for free. So, is that a wrap, Marcus? All right. All right. We'll see you next week, hopefully with elk blood under our fingernails. Wow.